Welcome back to the Laravel Podcast Season 4. Today we are talking about packages with Freik van de Herten and Marcel Pozio, the package master authors. Stay tuned. All right, welcome back to the Laravel Podcast Season 4, where every single episode is about a single topic. And today, we're talking about the last topic of the season. Uh, I'm very excited about this because I have two of my friends, not just one, to talk to today about this topic. Two people who are completely knowledgeable and capable and reputable and all this kind of stuff in this particular topic. So I'm going to do, I know that you all know, like, sometimes I'm like, oh, I don't want to make sure that I, I make the valet people feel better than whatever. So I always do it alphabetical. So we're going to start with Frank. Can you introduce yourself and say, oh, sorry, the topic. The topic is packages. And so we're going to talk about packages, package ecosystem, package development, all the kind of stuff. So, Frank, could you say hi to the people and tell them how you introduce yourself when you meet people, whatever way we meet people in the middle of a global pandemic? <laughs> uh, hello, everybody. Yeah, I'm Frank. Usually when I introduce myself to people, I don't say what I do for work. I just say, hey, I'm Frank. Uh, how are you? That's yeah. that's maybe <laughs> my, my introduction. I'm like a modest uh, Belgian who... Yeah, it doesn't give away much of himself in a first introduction. But uh, yeah, since this is a podcast where people are listening for like the package uh, development and, and Laravel knowledge uh, in general. Yeah, I'm the co-owner of a company called Spassi. Uh, we do a lot of Laravel uh, development and uh, yeah, we do a lot of open source uh, development too, which gets used uh, in the project. Um, that's like the very short intro, I yeah. guess. Perfect. And then Marcel? Yeah, hey, everybody. Um, my name is Marcel. My natural introduction would also probably just finish right there. Yep. So hey, it's I'm always Marcel. weird to, to talk about yourself. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm, uh, I also have my own company. It's called Beyond Code, where we do mostly developer tools and video courses for everything around the Laravel ecosystem. Yeah. Yeah. That's about it. Yeah. It's it's very interesting to me because I've discovered it's a very much a cultural thing about whether people instantly jump to talk about what you do versus not. So there's some cultures in which what do you do is the first question that someone asks somebody when they meet them. And then some cultures in which it's absolutely not the, the original co topic of conversation. It's almost considered like uncouth to just jump right to that. And so I've always been fascinated because I definitely grew up in a space where like, what do you do would be one of the first questions you'd ask an adult and spent more time since in places where like I can spend, I can spend multiple days with somebody and not have any idea, you know, what they actually do for work because it's like, is that really what defines us? So anyway, I, I appreciate you guys bringing that up. I know I'm the one who asked the question, but it's really interesting you said that. So Okay, so today we're talking about packages. So before I even blab on about what packages are in the world, um, I want to talk about what is a package. And once again, we're going to go alphabetically. I might do reverse alphabetical later so that, you know, Marcel gets to start sometimes. But let's keep alphabetical for a minute. So we're going to do our traditional question of explain it to a five-year-old. So uh, as folks with kids, I think we are a little bit, um, it's a little bit easier for us to actually like be able to explain things to a kid, even if your kids aren't five, five years old. So let's see how you do. So I'm just going to ask each of you to do the same thing. Explain what a package is in our world um, to a five-year-old. So, Frank, can you start? Yeah, sure. So, when you think of like a web application, and you would have, uh, you can think of it like some uh, as, as bricks just stacking, stacking together, like Lego blocks. You know, <laughs> Marcel's face tells me that's the same same one he was going to use. That's okay. <laughs> Keep going, Frank. <laughs> <laughs> so, if your application is is uh, is built up by bricks. What, what is a package? A package is just one kind of brick in your in your application that yeah maybe yeah you will need for an application you need like a red brick to go into your application and then a package is basically your sack of red bricks and you can have like the same red brick in other in other projects as well. So it's basically sharing building blocks and it has many advantages. But yeah, I don't want to take uh, too much uh, speaking sure. space because Marcel wants to answer as well. Uh. Yeah, and we'll definitely get into that. That's a really great introduction. Works with kids. So Marcel, imagine that Frank had not just said what he just said. <laughs> I don't. You don't have to compete. Yeah. I just want to hear how would you how would you pitch this? Yeah. So 
I can tell that we both have kids that love to play with Lego. Yes. That was my <laughs> <laughs> immediate thought as well when I thought about this. Um, and it's really hard to come up with something different because I think this really explains it well that, yeah, those are just building blocks that you can use to extend your application. And then you can just take them and share them across other like Lego buildings and use the same building box and share it. I think that's like the perfect explanation for the topic. Yeah, I love it. I like that you all did, a, I think, a better job of explaining it to five-year-old than I did in my brain. Because in my brain, I was I was always reaching for something a little bit more complex. I'm like, so, you know, every single time you build a car, you have to build a seat. Well, maybe you had a whole thing of seats, which it makes sense. But I think that it sometimes complicates it a little bit. So I just, I love this idea, the building blocks, the Legos. If we, if you both came up to the same conclusion, then obviously it's a good explanation, right? <laughs> so, okay. So I think, uh, Marcel, I'm going to ask you to start in this one. If you were to try and explain to somebody who had because like we didn't have like a package ecosystem in PHP for a long time. Even when we had pair packages, it was very complicated stuff like that. So until Composer, we really didn't kind of have that same concept of it that everybody else did. If you were to talk to an old PHP developer who just hadn't had the experience to work with packages, could you explain to them what are packages generally in the PHP world and, and kind of what's the ecosystem around them? Um, yeah, so I mean, me being someone that also worked with PHP pre-composer era yeah. um you know back then you were basically just copy pasting classes from php classes yeah. uh, which, which is a website that still exists and then you would you would go and copy like a whole bunch of files or download the zip file and now with packages you get uh not only the the source code of the the thing that you want the specific uh tool but you also get all of the dependencies bundled within it. Um, so, yeah, packages. I think once again, the Lego example is really good. It just allows you to share um, to share common used codes in PHP with others, mm -hmm. and then yeah. uh, basically just package everything to well, well, well package yeah, <laughs> everything perfect. together uh, in just one bundle that you can then reuse throughout multiple projects. I love that. And, um, and since we're talking a little bit about the history of it, um, Frank, could you talk a little bit about how um, using version control in packages kind of allows us to do things that we couldn't when we were just downloading zip files? Like what's what's the role of a versioning system and, uh, you know, Packagist, which is, you know, the, the site we use to deliver them and Composer, what role does that play in packages relative to Let's, so let's say I had a package in the PHP classes day, which was really just, hey, everybody, here's some code. What's different between that? And, and Mar Marcel just told us a few of them, right? Like we get our, depend our, our dependencies bundled with it and everything like that. But what are some of the other differences that come along with using a version system and all that kind of stuff to deliver them? Well, uh, let me start off with something that is seemingly really strange for the modern PHP developer. I think when you still had like a like the PHP classes and you need to download code into your project, what you needed to probably do as well is to yeah auto load those classes, and not right. all classes did it in the same way. So you had the, like your own auto loader file where you yeah did the auto loading part of all of your stuff there. Yeah. And uh, with uh, modern package development, and it, it's basically just Composer, uh, that whole auto-loading thing goes away because it's, it's standardized. All the packages do it in, in the same way. Now, with, uh, to, to answer the, the other part of your question, so if you would uh, just create a, a, or grab a class from PHP classes and you need to update that, that would be like a manual process to do and it can be tedious imagine that you have like maybe four or five projects that need the same class uh yeah you would copy paste it into your your own project but how would you know like i did it right correctly because if you do manual stuff you're going to make mistakes because we're all humans yep. whereas with uh um uh, with modern packages and with composer it is just a command and it's automated 
and you really know this is the right version that I'm going to get. There's, uh, I'm not going to jump into that now because that's like a section on its own, I think. Yep. Yeah. We also have a thing like, a thing like uh, semantic versioning where you can specify, I only want to have like bug fixes or I only want to have uh, like new features or I want to have like the latest version, but I have to adapt my codes a little bit on it. So in general, it's just much easier to pull in updates because it's just a command. It's yeah. it's automated and you can run the same command across all of your projects. Yeah, that's great. So normally the next section of this would be when I would say, what when's the last time you used blah, blah, blah system? Now, obviously that's even silly, but I would say I, I am actually super curious which package, Marcel, of that you did not create <laughs> Do you install on every single application or almost every single? What, What's was your most yeah. common? I think without doing some advertisement now, I think <laughs> it would be Ray from Spassi because nice. this is uh, just a really good helper package. Besides that, it would be the Laravel IDE mm -hmm. helper one. So I guess it's mostly just little helpers during development. Yeah, like development I don't tools. have this one package that I always use within all of my um, projects. It, it really just depends on the project itself, but all these little uh, tools that help with development. And I think that's a perfect introduction to the idea that, that packages can be something that aid the actual application in doing something it's doing, or they can be something that we call dev packages. And so it goes in, instead of require, it goes in require dev. And those are things that are meant to be an aid to us in the development process, but they're not actually a part of the application functioning. So that's, a, I really appreciate you bringing that up. And, and we've already done an episode that, that talks about Composer. So we don't need to d dive too far into that. Um, and if y'all are listening and some of these things are unfamiliar, I'd recommend you go take a listen to the um, the Composer episode. But that's, that's a really helpful note that if there is anything you're gonna require every single time, it's, it's going to be about development because lots of the other things that aren't development tools often are specific to the needs of the application you're developing. And if and if, if an, every single application needs something in production, there's a good chance it might just make its way to the core anyway. Right. Um, Frank, same yeah. question for you. Um, of the things you have not created, uh, is there anything that you bring in on every app or almost every app? Well, while Marcel was answering, I... Uh, opened up a project to to take a look because uh -huh. my my normal answer would be like a, a debug bar because yep. yeah it's it's the most common one I think because it's just so powerful yeah. but I also I, I wanted to to see if there is like another one uh, that I that I could mention yeah and then I I'm coming on on the other one from uh, from Barry van den Heuvel who created uh, debug bar and that's the IDE helper so mm -hmm. this is a package that um, can help your IDE, uh, in my case, PHP Storm, understand some of the magic uh, of Laravel. So you get like better auto completion uh, and stuff. And that's something that is on every project. Uh, I love that. Um, and for, for English... So thanks, thanks Barry, for, <laughs> <was gonna> say, <laughs> for both of yeah. those. Uh. Yep. <laughs> so can you say his name again for me so I can get it right in my head? Uh, I think if you pronounce it correctly, it would be Bari. His full name, sorry. Van den Heuvel? Bari, Bari van den Heuvel. Van den Heuvel. Okay, thank you. Cool. I've, I've never actually heard it said out loud until right now, so it took me a second to figure out. So, yeah, so for anybody who doesn't know, that's Barry and then V-D-H-E-U-V-E-L. And if you've ever used the Laravel IDE helper or the um, Laravel debug bar, those are both um, things he did. Is he fruitcake or somebody else fruitcake? Uh, I, I, think think he's from, I think he's from Fruitcake. I okay. think he's yeah. the, the founder there. He also created the Laravel Cores package that so many of us used before it got um, integrated into the uh, Cores handling got integrated into the, the core of Laravel. Okay, so this is really helpful because it kind of gave us a little bit of context and grouping around the type of packages we're talking about. And if you were to think about packages, are there any other kind of like subgroupings? And this is questions to both of you. Are there any other subgroupings of like type of package you think about? So we just talked about their packages that actually function in the application and do something application, which would probably live in the require. And then there's applications that aid us in development, which are probably going to live in require dev. Are there any other subgroupings among those two that we should think about? Or, or as you think about it, are those kind of mainly how we organize our packages in, you know, in our minds? I think we, we also have to differentiate between package dependent uh, between application dependencies mm -hmm. and global dependencies. So for example, things like the Laravel installer or uh, your tool Lambo mm -hmm. would be a 
package, but it's not something that you install into your application. It's a global package, which is available throughout your whole development system. That's a really good point. Um, so are there any, let's talk global. I think global is going to be a much smaller section. So let's let's just kind of get it out of the way. But I really appreciate you bringing that up. So other than the Laravel installer or a tool like Lambo or Valet or something like that, are there any other kind of globally installed uh, composer packages that you use in your day-to-day work, either you? Mm-mm-mm. I think those two for me are the main ones, I think. I'm trying to think if there's anything else I use. Hmm. Uh, yeah, no, Valet isn't a package. That's more of an... A tool on itself. Hmm. For me, it would be Expose. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I'm biased, but... <laughs> yeah, that's okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm using that one instead of Ngrok. <laughs> yep. So if anybody know, doesn't know, Marcel has a tool called Expose that is a PHP-powered version of basically what Ngrok does. So it allows you to share your local development sites with an actual public URL so you can uh, expose it up to webhooks or you can uh, give it to somebody else to, to view directly from your machine. I'm sure there's probably some other ones. There's probably another one that I made that I use because <laughs> I love little command line tools like that, but none at the top of my head. So, okay, cool. So let's so let's say we're primarily talking about application dependencies. Within application dependencies, are there any other subgroupings or does it really just kind of fall into, I mean, we can ar- make some arbitrarily, right? These ones are about databases. These ones are, but, oh, you know what? Here's, here's the thing. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I think you could also make like a distinction between like very large packages and small packages, mm-hmm. you know, they they feel a lot more different. Some of the packages also have have UI components to that. We mm-hmm. could, could touch upon that. What you can do in a package. Yeah. Most of the packages don't, but some of the big ones they they have, and they have like a whole different feel to them. Uh, yeah. I think that's a good point. And yet, so can can you guys help me kind of like have an example of one of the smallest packages you use, and then one of the the biggest packages that you've seen, so we can kind of like actually set that in people's brains. I think there are a lot of smaller ones, like, you know, just helper functionality, like converting XML to an array, stuff like that, Yeah, which is something that is just way easier if you let a package handle it than do it with simple XML yourself. Uh, So probably just things like that. Mm. And I think maybe an example of a bigger one could uh, could be Livewire or something, which, Yeah. yeah, just... Yeah. Grabs its hooks into like the uh, the the view system yeah. of Laravel. That's like a, a totally different beast than than a small helper package. Yeah, that's a good. And point. for the UI, it would be something like Nova, which yeah. is a package, but yeah. it, it's basically an application on its own. Yeah, wrapped inside a package. Yeah, that's a great point. Okay, so we're talking about all these different types and sizes of packages and kind of what involves in them. So I think it's a really good moment for us to talk about two things. First of all, actually, second of all, let's talk about all the things that packages expose. But first of all, what are all these Illuminate packages? And I know that we probably covered it in one of our previous ones. But if someone looks at the composer.json of a a Laravel app, they're going to see actually not just Illuminate, right? They're going to see a whole bunch of stuff out of the box. Like I'm trying to see what's what's the latest version and honestly it might be worth us doing just a quick look at the laravel framework um itself to just try and figure out like what does it or sorry not laravel framework laravel slash laravel to see like what do we actually get out of the box we don't have to go through all of them individually but first of all i think let's just start with a re- quick reminder can either you, either you just kind of give us a quick reminder of what the illuminate packages are yeah sure i'll uh, i'll take this one so laravel itself is is built out of uh of packages itself uh as well uh, i'm going through uh to a project here now and i'm opening it up so laravel itself consists of several packages in the illuminate uh namespace i think illuminate was like the code name yep. uh, of laravel and these are n- not your regular kind of packages. I think some people would say these uh, are tightly integrated packages. Uh, I'd say they are just beautifully working uh, together and they are <laughs> like built uh, built for, for each other. Yeah. And it's basically a way to, to, organize, to organize code, to have like uh, all the functionality of the art system goes into the auth package, all the functionality of the broadcasting system goes into the broadcasting package. And it's yep. basically just a way of, of organizing codes. That's that's how you should should think about it. 
Yeah. And in, in theory, you can use many of those packages independently. If anybody's interested in that, I have a project called Torch where I actually show you how to use each package on its own. And, and it's not just on its own, right? Like often in each of those examples, you'll probably new up an, a, 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 an Illuminate container and then you'll pass it into your Illuminate database thing that you're working with. So they're, they're, they depend on each other a little bit, but you don't have to have the entirety of Laravel to work with them, which is, it's just, it wasn't that the case originally. And Taylor's put a lot of work into trying to make that possible for folks. Now that you're here, Matt, I should thank you for those storage things because I've used them. Oh, I've really? made like, like really horrible Frankenstein projects with like the core <laughs> Zint framework, but it uses like blade views and, and, uh, and the config. And that made like the whole Zint experience is much much better i love that uh, and that's where it came from we were we were converting a code igniter app that we had running for ages and i started doing laravel and i said this needs to be laravel and so i started bit by bit just every time we'd convert something in i'd add it to torch basically that's the story and a lot of people have said like hey when i'm working with legacy stuff i still want modern sessions or i still want modern El you know eloquent or whatever so that's i'm, I'm happy to hear that though so Marcel, if you look at the composer.json for like a modern Laravel app in 8.x, can you just kind of walk through the require block and just give us a real quick note? And it's funny because I'm I'm seeing Laravel cores. I was thinking that uh, Taylor re recreated Laravel cores. No, he just actually brought the Laravel cores package oh. in. But can you kind of walk through those require pack, um, packages and just kind of tell us what each of them is doing? Yeah, sure. So uh, the first one that we see is actually not a package, but yeah. it's a PHP, uh, which is like one... Ex Extension? What's yeah, I don't even know it's good you call uh, it. Because normally it's extensions uh, there, right? Like PHP is the only one that's not an extension that we use this way. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So in there we we basically specify the version constraint of PHP itself that uh, a Laravel project needs. Uh, and with the latest version, it's 7.3 and up or uh, Laravel, uh, PHP 8. Uh, then it would be the proxy package from uh, Chris Fidel, that the right way yeah, to pronounce I him, yeah. I think. Yeah. yeah. Um, and the proxy package basically allows you to define uh, trusted proxies where uh, things like uh, SSL or the IP address, if you mm -hmm. want, for example, to retrieve the IP address of the incoming request, and the request is going through a proxy like, um, for example, in Vapor, or if it goes through one of those AWS proxies. Yeah, or Cloudflare, could I think add is a this, one, right? Or Cloudflare, right. Mm -hmm. Then you could add uh, this as a proxy so that you get the real IP address instead of getting the proxy IP address. Yeah. Then we have the cores package uh, that we briefly mentioned, which allows you to set up cores rules, uh, which is probably something that everyone <laughs> that ever deals with APIs uh, yeah. runs in. Um, gets mad next, about sometimes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. right. And we yeah. covered that in the uh, the episode with uh, Rizki. Uh, so if anybody didn't get a chance to listen to the mm. security episode, oh my gosh, that was freaking fantastic. He's brilliant. So take a listen. If you've, if you've gotten mad at cores and haven't heard that episode, go listen. Uh, next up is Guzzle, which is an HTTP client which Laravel then uses to build its own HTTP uh, client mm -hmm. using the HTTP facade on top of to simplify things. And then we have the Laravel framework package, which like we, we said, we have all these Illuminate packages mm -hmm. and they basically get built automatically out of the framework package, which sort of includes all of them. So instead of listing all these, all these Illuminate packages, we just say that we require the framework. And last but not least, we have Tinker, which gives you the PHP Artisan Tinker command, which was in the core. Yeah. And then it got pulled out into its own package. Yeah. And a note there, um, before uh, I ask Frank to continue, uh, Taylor has often kind of found himself in circumstances where individual tools in the framework get to a point where they're developing at a different pace or the dependencies are sometimes problems for people. And he'll extract these, not because they're more optional you know they still come out of the box but it's just helpful to develop in them develop them outside of the context of the the, the the illuminate framework or whatever i can't remember the specifics around tinker but that's definitely kind of like so for i don't think that this is a sign to anybody that now tinker doesn't matter as much you know if it comes out of the box it's still intended to be used out of the box and i also think that with the laravel release cycle if it's in its own package then yeah it's basically out of out of the specific release cycle that is for the framework. So if for whatever reason, 
we want to have a new major version of Tinker, we could do that without having to rely on the standard a, release that's cycle. That's a really good point because it, it, it actually can be, and it also can be the opposite. If, if Tinker doesn't change very often, you can see Tinker's mm. constraint is at 2.5 right now. You don't have to constantly be bumping versions of Tinker when nothing's really changed. Yeah, good right. point. Yeah. And of course, just little plugs. And I'm, I'm trying to not make this a full plug episode because we'd never talk about anything else because you all both have so many things to plug. But I will plug that Marcel has a great tool called Tinkerwell. Okay, um, go Thanks. look it up. It's Tinker in the UI. <laughs> All right, so uh, Frank, can you kind of walk us through the required dev block of the, the composer.json? Yeah, sure. So require.dev, let's first explain why uh, it is separate from, from yeah. regular require. So require, that's what your application basically needs, and that's the packages that you are going to pull in on a production environment. Require dev, those aren't needed by your application code itself, but these help you test your code or yeah, provide tooling to uh, help you write uh, the code. And if uh, you deploy uh, using a sensible strategy, then these uh, packages only will get installed locally, maybe on staging, but not on production. You probably won't need them there. Yeah. So let's uh, start off with like the, I think, six packages that are in there. Mm -hmm. So the first one is already a very fun one. It's called Facade Ignition, and it's uh, something that uh, Marcel and our team have co-created. And this uh, package basically contains the error page that you see um, whenever yeah, you mess something up in uh, while coding your application. So it shows the error message, it so shows the trace, and maybe a solution. So that's uh, that's Ignition. Then we have uh, Faker PHP slash Faker. This is a library where you can just generate yeah, pieces of data that you can use in your test. So if you want to have like an email address, then you can ask the Faker library, give me an email address. Or if you want to have like a number between certain uh, certain limits, then you can just ask Faker that. And it has like, yeah, tons of functions to help you generate uh, fake uh, data. Next up, we have Laravel Sale. This is, I think, the newest one uh, here. This provides functionality to interact with uh, Laravel's default uh, Docker uh, environment. Then we have Mockery. This is a package that you'll use in your test to mock objects. And this could basically be, yeah, I think an episode on its own. Yep, so a mock, a mock is basically just a class that uh, mimics another class and uh, you can basically uh, test which kind of behavior uh, it has. But yeah, that's basically a lesson on its own. Then we have um, another package by uh, our friend Nuno Maduro. Uh, it's called Collision. And this one basically gives you very nice error output in, uh, in the console. Uh, I think he showed this at, I think, at Lar Laracon Online, I'm not, not sure, or, or at, uh, at yep. the talk I saw with him before, that yep. if you don't have collision, you get like a really nasty error meshes, and this one makes it really, really good. Yeah. So I think it's, it's very nice to have it in there. And the last one, it really needs no introduction because everybody that has been developing Laravel for a while has gotten in touch with this package. It's called PHP Unit, and that's basically the yeah, de facto uh, test runner for PHP until uh, Nuno reaches world domination with best. <laughs> we'll see. We'll we'll see if that uh, if that happens. And those Which are the. Which yeah. still uses PHP unit just yeah, to know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah indeed <laughs> indeed yeah it's, it. it's world dominion will be built upon <laughs> PHP units yes yeah <laughs> and that's a that's a really good point though because I think a lot of the things that we rely on just because we see packages here doesn't mean there's not other packages that these ones are relying on so if you look at for example Laravel framework the Illuminate classes have very significant dependencies on the Symphony classes and so if you are kind of new to the PHP PHP world, you may not even know what these Symphony classes are. So just a quick note about that. Symphony is another PHP framework, and they originally kind of like pioneered this idea in the PHP world of creating your internal dependencies as classes that can be used by everybody else. And I think their creator actually gave a talk saying, hey, everybody, here's all these classes. Why don't you go create amazing things with them? And Laravel kind of took that to heart, and Taylor actually kind of took those classes. So when you're dealing with, like, for example, a representation in PHP of a request, it's a 
Laravel request object, but you'll see it extends a Symphony request object. So as you're learning to like kind of source dive and dig into like what methods are available to me here or what does this type pin actually mean, just note that like each of these dependencies often has dependencies in, underneath them. Like Ignition is built on top of whoops, right? Am I right that it's it's built on top of it? Map it it uses it, but it could it could be um, independent of that. But okay. as of now, it's it's built yeah. upon it. Yeah, and I'm sure plenty of the other ones here, like Collision. I I know that Nuno Nuno knows a lot about working on the command line, and so every single time I look at uh, his packages, I often see underneath they're they're using this color formatter and that table formatter. So I'm sure that Collision's built a lot. A lot. So it's helpful for us to know that when you look at a package and you want to th you know thank that person, also kind of note what else is going on underneath there, not only. To, to give them credit, but also if you are considering doing similar work in the future, but this package doesn't do exactly what you want, you may find that some of its dependencies are doing that one piece you actually care about. So as you think about packages, or maybe one day being a package author, it's really good to kind of take a look at the composer.json of anything you really appreciate. And I, uh, just to chime in on this, I think that's also really important when you think about uh, ways of how you could create your own package. It's not... Mm -hmm. It's not just about coming up with this brand new genius idea that nobody ever thought of. Yeah. Uh, a lot of times it can also just be take this dependency, which looks too complex for you, and then create the API that you want on top of that, and yeah. then basically just wrap it. And even if it's just for yourself, so it doesn't yeah. need to be this one package that nobody ever thought of. It yeah. could just be some decorating pa package. I love that. And I mean, the HTTP facade, the entire tool in Laravel was originally uh, a package that Adam Wathen made called ZTTP, which was him saying, Guzzle is miserable to work with. What is the API I actually want when I'm interacting with external you know, calls, like basically wrapping around curl or whatever? And that's what ZTTP was. And then he and Taylor basically rewrote it and put it into Laravel as HTTP. So I, I love that that note. It's, you know, and, and one of the things that Taylor and Adam have both mentioned often on the podcast is that it's their own intolerance for inconvenience that is what leads them to create some of their best tooling. It's like kind of like I really I deal with this thing every single day, but it just drives me bonkers. Well, why don't you write out the API that you'd like to work with? And then maybe you can create the package that gives other people that same kind of experience. There's also some other ways to think about package creation that I think is really worth noting. Um, Frank, you mentioned this on the podcast a while back, but you mentioned that a lot of your first packages that you released under Spotsy was actually, they were Zen packages that you, I don't know if you all had written them or other people had written them, but they were from the Zen world and that you said, oh, we want these available for the Laravel world. And so you kind of tweaked the code, of, of course, because it's PHP, the PHP classes moved fine and you probably just had to rebuild the bridge between those classes and the framework, and then you released it as a, as a Spotsy package. So sometimes it's even taking something that you or somebody else has written. Of course, if it's somebody else, it's with their permission. Um, and lots of credit and everything like that, and and repackaging it, saying, "Hey, I want to make this available to other people." Like like Adam Wathen had written a thing about how to do method overloading in PHP, and he put it in a gist. And I said, "I don't know if anybody's ever going to want this as a package, but what do you think if I wrap this thing up as a package just in case somebody ever wants it?" And he's like, "As long as you're the one willing to take on the responsibility, the maintenance responsibility, go ahead." And so I I've used it in the package like once or something like that. It's it's probably the least packet popular package I've ever made because not a lot of people are doing method overloading. But again, it's that same concept. I was like, I want it to be accessible if somebody wants it. So um, it's cool to think about what are the differences, especially for you two. I mean, since we're already here, are there any other inspirations you want to list out for what has motivated you to make a package at any particular moment? For me, it's basically what do I need in a in a project. So yeah. if I need something in a project, and I think this could be useful for for others, then I create a package. And it's also the thing that you mentioned before. It's just like a low pain tolerance to things that are difficult. They should be should be easier to understand. I think all three in this call uh, have have this this urge to make things to make things better and easier. And those are mainly like the, the, the two big motivations for me. Maybe sometimes I also make a package because just the subject interests me and I want to learn a little bit from it. Yeah. But I'm by far the most motivated if I can use the, the package myself. Yeah. That's, that's my motivation. For me, for me, it's sometimes the other way around. Yeah. Which is like, for example, with Expose, this Angrog alternative, I don't like the I didn't like the UI of of Angrok, so I wanted to build something nicer. But going for hey, let's rewrite this in PHP uh, might be a bit weird. So it's also just this 
this uh, way of seeing, can I actually do this? Would mm -hmm. it work with PHP? Or same with the Laravel WebSockets package that I did together with Frederick. Uh, I guess that's also not the typical PHP package. Yeah. Writing a WebSocket server in PHP. Yeah. So this is really something that interests me in package development is just, you know, to done? see, can it be done? I yeah, like right. that. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, I love that because I think one of the things that interests me a lot is the things that I don't, I know I don't know how to do. So it's, you know, I think I'm a little bit less likely to push the bounds of what can be done than you are, Marcel. But I think for me, it's often like, well, I want the same thing that Frank was talking about. I want this API to be, you know, more enjoyable, but I know that I don't know how to do it. This package would be a really great opportunity to learn it. Right. And so like Lambo originally was me recognizing that every single time I create a new project, I do the same things over and over and over again. I bet you can do that with bash scripts. I don't know how to write bash scripts. I'm going to teach myself how to write bash scripts and then build this Lambo thing. <laughs> and then later somebody came along and said, well, what about Laravel zero instead of bash scripts? I was like, well, I don't know Laravel zero, but sounds like a fun thing to learn. So, and it took us like a year and a half, but now it's rewritten in Laravel zero and it's way better and way more testable. And I'd never written with Laravel Zero before that. So it's a fun opportunity for me to try something that I've never done before. Even if I knew it could be done, I think, Marcel, you're more like, nobody in the world knows if this can be done. <laughs> for me, I'm like, I know a smarter person than me can do it, but I want to learn the thing anyway. So so there's lots of different motivations. And I appreciate you guys talking with me about this. Okay. For, for me, it's also a little bit sometimes for, I, I create a package as a vehicle to propose things to the core. You yeah, know? I think last week, even Taylor tweeted out something that signals can now be processed in artisan commands. Nice. Uh, that's awesome. so, and I thought, hey, yeah, in this example, we just use Symfony, but we can make it so much nicer. Mm -hmm. And then instead of PRing it to the framework itself, I thought, yeah, let's create a package and then, uh, yeah, I let the uh, Laravel people know, like, if you like any of these things, just steal slash borrow yep. uh, them. You know, I'm happy now because I can al already use this. Yeah. And if you if you like some of it, then it can go into framework. And I think a bigger, a bigger example of this could be uh, BladeX, which uh, I don't want to take or, or let my team take all the, the credit for Laravel Blade components. But Bladex was certainly a big inspiration for, for adding that to the framework. So I think it's it's also good as a vehicle to yeah, propose new ideas that might be a little bit too wild to include all uh, in, in in a short time span, but it's good to let these ideas gestate in a in a package. Yeah. I like that. And I, I do want to do a, a big note. I I and the the five minute geek show a couple of years back, I did something and I think I was called share the shine. I'll try and find it. But for me, it's really, 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 really important for people to get credit for the work that they do. Like it's just absolutely vital. And when I find people in the community trying to credit hog or credit grab, it really bothers me a lot because there's nothing that is more annoying to me than people who value their own benefit over like the, the the needs and the the benefit of other people, right? And that's one of the reasons why I say, if you see a great package, go look who's behind that package, right? In the Laravel world, a lot of the packages that say Laravel hyphen something else, like it's the Laravel version of this, if you look at it, it's 80 lines of code on top of a PHP one, right? It's just a bridge to that one. And that doesn't mean you shouldn't use it, but know who actually did the work to do it. So that, that was to say, um, I think sometimes people can build with the mindset that you just mentioned, Frank, with the intention of getting their name in the composer.json require block, because then their name will be famous or something like that. And I want everyone to hear that I think the a lot of the people who you know about have worked with Taylor or the core team to contribute things that don't get their names in there at all. Like I mentioned Adam doing the work on HTTP. Like Adam Wathen pairing with Taylor is responsible for a good portion of our coolest features with Adam's names not attached to them at all, right? And I know that's true for the rest of us because I know that Caleb uh, Porzio in his work in Livewire worked together with Ta uh, Taylor a lot. And of course, Taylor did the work, right? But those their brains were involved, right? And Caleb was involved a lot in the view components as well because he was developing Livewire at the same time and shared some ideas with Taylor and Taylor shaped some ideas with Caleb. So it's not as if like Taylor's just stealing other people's ideas. No, not at all. But when we contribute our our 
greater desire is for the broader community to have access to these things, not for our to for us to create a package that, that get, then gets included. So I love what you said. What you did not say was, I created this little um, component around um, handling signals in Tinker so that that component could be the one that got included in the require block. Like that's, that's to me, everybody, that's not the way we should be doing these things. Like if that's the way it works, okay, cool. Like Fidelibur's trusted proxy, Fruitcake's Laravel cores, it makes so much more sense for those to be brought into the core as dependencies. But the, a lot of the stuff that we do isn't the case. Like I was just talking with Taylor like a couple months ago saying, you know what, I'm dealing with this thing where my client and I are working on this thing with we need to do basically um, – we have encoded JSON objects, and we want to be able to modify those JSON objects on our Eloquent thing and then save them back in. And we discovered that it actually really wasn't very easy to do that. So I threw together a proof of, proof of concept for how we were doing it. And I said, hey, Taylor, here's the proof of concept I'm working on. You know, does this make sense? Would you make any modifications? He's like, yeah, I would probably split it up because mine handled both our object and array syntax. He's like, I'd probably split it up into one object, one, one array, one. I was like, cool, we might do that, but here's the code. And then Taylor rewrote it in the Taylor way and then put it in the core. I didn't need my name there, whatever. Like he's the one who helped me even think about how to write the thing in the first place. But I got to collaborate with everybody else having access to that thing. Right. And I just want everybody to hear that, like the people who you see their name publicly, there's a lot more going on where their desire is for the good of the framework. Their desire is for the good of the community, not for their name to be celebrated. And I know I took like way too long to talk about that, but I feel like every once in a while when people see like, oh my gosh, this person got famous from making amazing contributions, whatever, their desire is to come in and be the next to that person, right? I want to be the next Adam or whatever. And a lot of times what comes up is that they do so in a way that unlike an Adam or a Taylor, they say, well, they got famous, therefore I'm going to get famous like them. But the thing is those guys got famous by helping people, right? The two people on this podcast became reputable by trying to create create things that help other people. And so I just want to note to everyone in the community that like, not like you're going to be caught by the police or something like that, but I'd really encourage like your number one priority being helping people, not becoming popular. So I'm so sorry. That's just like a really strong thing that I'm very passionate about. So I just <laughs> wanted to go on a rant of that for a second. So it's an important subject. So I think you, uh, you rightly took like the time to, to say this. Uh. I don't know if you want to talk about this some more, but I think one, one important point about this is that you mentioned becoming famous or popular packages. And I think there's like this double-edged sword where if we take a look at, if I'm I'm searching for a package that I want to include in my application, I'm obviously looking for things like GitHub stars, which mm -hmm. shouldn't be something that I should consider because, I mean, it's just a point where people click, which yeah. gets gets bigger based on, the reputation of the people and doesn't necessarily mean that it's mm -hmm. a better package than something that has less uh, GitHub stars, but for some reason, it's we still, still something that, that yeah. I look at it. Yeah. Um, and I also think that this shouldn't be, this shouldn't be the reason why you create a package. It shouldn't be that you want to reach 1000 GitHub stars or anything. And there's also articles out there like, this is the perfect readme to get 1,000 GitHub stars <laughs> and stuff like that. that. And th this it shouldn't be the motivation at all for this. Mm -hmm. So if your package solves a problem that you personally have, yep. just be happy Good. that you solved it on your own. And if other people chime in and want to use it, that's even better. But yeah, there's this little double-edged sword that if I'm myself looking for other packages, it certainly is a factor that I... I consider yeah because if something is more more popular by having more stars it might yeah. be uh, something that might be better to include and if our systems work you know starring or looking at packages downloads then those things became more starred or got more packages download because more people found them helpful, right? Like Google is evil, but the original value that Google provided as a search engine was not linking based on, you know, not giving you search order based on manipulations of, you know, whatever, but by saying how valuable is this to people? And if anybody doesn't know, like I used to do search engine optimization, the original innovation of Google was largely around recognizing 
what are the signals that other people find value in this particular search link for this particular topic? And so they did all this analysis to try and figure out. And that's why their their answers were so helpful at the beginning is because if you search for fish nets, they're not just going to look for the number of instances of the word fish net or just the word fish net in your domain. They're also going to say, how many other people who are talking about fish nets link to this particular website? And so it's the similar thing. If our systems are working well, we're doing a really good job of exposing valuable packages to people and also us as you know people who are on twitter and me as a podcaster are if i'm doing my job well i'm exposing the thing that is going to be useful to you and so that person doesn't have to be a marketing executive in order to get it out there it's just the usefulness now granted there's a little bit of the if they build it they will come mindset like we do need to do some marketing right and we all laugh in the Laravel community about the marketing we do around things but again the, what's the motivation are you marketing it so more people can use your pop your your thing and it could be become very useful or are you marketing it because you know you want to be the next Adam Weathern or whatever. So, okay. Sorry. I think okay. this is also like a, a good distinction between packages that we haven't made yet. Uh, you have free packages, but you also have paid packages and motivations are totally different there because yeah. with free packages, uh, I totally agree. You shouldn't do it for uh, like uh, your popularity. I think a, a healthy reason would be just for learning and helping others that's a basic motivation there, but for paid packages, it can be totally different, different because yeah, Absolutely. you want you want to you want to you want to sell it, right? Yeah. So yeah. and there there are other other concerns there. Yep. I think there's and just to be clear, because I think sometimes when people hear me go on my rants about let's all just be Mister Rogers to each other, they think that I now have a problem with people making money or getting value of those things. Not at all. If you want to sell a package, awesome. That's totally fine. If you capitalize on the popularity you got by helping people and turn it into a full-time job like Adam did, that's freaking awesome. You know what I mean? Like Adam worked at Titan when he wrote his first book that acted on his popularity and was able to go full-time. And I'm so freaking happy for him. Caleb Porzio did the same thing. So freaking happy for him. So there's nothing wrong with getting value. For me, it's more about like what's the goal in the end, right? And it's a totally time tiny nuance, you know, but to me, that nuance really makes the difference between, between, do I look at this person as one of the helpers, right? Or do I look at somebody, this person as someone who's basically helping themselves under the guise of helping other people? Because th that's a very different, very small, but very imp impactful distinction for me, you know? But I know that's not what this this episode is about. I'm sorry, everybody. This is just like my personal passion. So, okay. So the next thing I wanted to talk about with you guys is when we're talking about packages, there's a lot of different ways that individual packages can expose functionality into your application. So I figured, why don't we just kind of go there and talk about what things it can do? So arbitrarily, I'm just going to randomly pick. Well, actually, no, I'll just say it in one of you, what you can pick it. I think the first thing it exposes is literally just PHP classes, right? So can one of you two kind of tell us a little bit about what it looks like for a package to expose PHP classes into your application? Sure. Yep. All right. So exposing PHP classes, I think is already kind of the wrong words because okay. basically yeah. uh, what a package does, it, it just tells Composer and then therefore the application that requires it, hey, I have a number of classes that are, for example, within this namespace uh, that get auto-loaded automatically. So it's available. So yeah, maybe by that it exposes yeah, it. Yeah, I think. I, yeah, 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 right. And that's pretty much all that the package does. So Composer basically just does the, the auto-loading and therefore your application just knows without you having to do anything that certain classes are available so that your package could then provide additional logic within yeah. these classes. I think uh, that would be the simplest way to say yeah. this. And usually those are under some kind of a namespace that is often like your your first level namespace, like so I'm talking about PHP namespaces, would be usually the name of your vendor, right? It would be beyond code right. or spussy. And then the second one would often, but not always, be the name of the package. And then they often will have their own sub namespaces under there. So, so the main thing, the simplest, the majority of the simplest packages do is give you some PHP to work with, right? Like, hey, here's a class, and somewhere that the class is defined as having these particular methods available to you. And when you were talking about converting XML to JSON or something like that, it might be a single class. Maybe even with a single method, it might be just an invocable, you know, class that just literally just says, hey, pass me some XML and I'm going to output some JSON and we're, we move on with our days. And that's a perfectly valid thing, right? It's not quite the same as um, the JavaScript world where we talk about like a left pad function that literally has like one line of code or something. <laughs> but, the, you know, it makes the API of something that's maybe a little bit miserable to work with a little bit easier. 
Okay. Right. So what's the next most common thing that you guys think, and either you can answer on this, that, that, a, that a, a Laravel facing package would expose to the, the application? Um, let's start off by saying that a package can basically just do anything that yeah. you can do in a project. Yeah. Um, so any of the Laravel specific things comes to mind. I, maybe the first one that comes to mind is like a config file. Mm -hmm. Like maybe you want to configure it, yeah, how a certain package should behave. Then your package can actually have a config file. And that config file is loaded by a service provider, a service provider like you yeah, know and love in a regular application. But I'm already diving into the rabbit hole here. Well, well let's just start with service providers because that would give us the, the hook for a lot of other things. So if your package wanted to have a service provider, why? And what does it look like to register it? And, it, and just so everyone knows, we're going to talk a little bit, hopefully not too deeply, but we're going to talk a little bit about the structure of what creating a, a package looks like, only because I think for everybody as package consumers, it's helpful for us to know what's actually happening when these, these service providers are auto-registering or whatever else. So we're, we're it's, this is a little bit like inside baseball, but I think that it's going to be really helpful for you as a package consumer and maybe a potential auth package author, dear listener, to kind of hear how some of these things work and what it can do. So, Frank, please continue. When you talk about a service provider, why would you create a service provider in a package and what does it look like to integrate that service provider with Laravel app so it knows how to run it? Yeah. So I should, I should first say that not every package has a service provider. Right. Uh, Laravel specific packages have a service provider probably. probably. If you have a, a framework agnostic package, then you probably don't have a service yeah. provider at all. Then you must set up like the, the package using the provided PHP code by the, uh, of the package. But let's talk about like Laravel specific packages because the audience is probably familiar with, with Laravel a lot. So the package service provider is basically a class where you just register all the things that uh, your package needs. It's a class where you put like bootstrapping code to make Laravel aware of, hey, there's like a command here that I can use. Hey, there's a config file that I should read here. Hey, here's a piece of middleware that maybe uh, that maybe we can use. And that's something that you set up in a service uh, provider. Now, probably when you've installed a package, I think if you if you done Laravel in the past two years or something, you didn't have to register that uh, service provider into your application. So in the old days, you must have registered the service provider in a config file of Laravel. But nowadays, it happens automatically. It's something that was, uh, now that we're crediting people, it's important to credit people. This is yep. something that was added by our buddy Dries Fins. Uh, Laravel will uh, actually has a mechanism to discover the service providers of a package. And you see that whenever you uh, type composer update, uh, there's like an entry at the end, I think, like discovering packages. And then basically Laravel goes to every package in your vendor directory, and it takes a look at which composer JSON file mentions a Laravel service provider. Yeah. And then it will load that up. That's basically in, in a few sentences how that works. That's great. So we talked about service providers and how to load, and you kind of gave us a quick hint that one of the things they could load is a config file. And I think one of the next foundational things for us to talk about is publishing. Marcel, could you talk to me a little bit about what publishing, you know, what what basically, what does it mean for a, a package to publish stuff and how do we call it and what type of things do they publish? So like Frig mentioned, when a package has a service provider and has a config file, most of the time you want to have the config file be publishable so that the, the user of your package can modify the config file. Another common example of things that you want to publish are migrations, mm -hmm. or uh, if you have a package with a UI, you might have something like CSS or JavaScript files, like Nova publishes those files, for example. And then in the service provider, you would basically just tell the framework this pack, hey, this package can publish a file in this location, and when you do publish it, copy it to this new name. Yeah, and then you can give those publish commands also a certain text so that I could say, this is a list of config files that I publish, and this is base. This is a migration, and then uh, the user can run PHP artisan vendor colon publish, and then provide the service provider name. Uh, or choose it from an interactive list. And then the framework is going to basically just copy the files that you specified 
to the locations that you want. And yeah. um, that's basically what publishing is. It's just registering with a framework, hey, these are files that I want to copy to a certain location. Yeah. And some packages require you to publish things in order to work. Like if there's CSS or JavaScript right. that needs to be served publicly from this package, you have to publish them or the CSS or the JavaScript won't work. Some of them allow you to publish, right? Like they'll have a default that you can change. And I think that's often the case with a config or if you publish a template, um, they say, hey, we've got this default config. We've got this default template that we're going to use in our package. But you may want to change how the template looks or you want to may change want to change some of the config values. A lot of packages allow you to con change the config values without publishing because they tell you what environment keys those config files are reading by default. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you don't want to use environment keys or sometimes the, the package author didn't do it that way. And so that allows you to publish it. So we talked about publishing. We talked about config. We talked about customizable templates and service providers. Are there and, and migrations as well? Are there any other things y'all think about that are common for Laravel packages to allow to be you know, basically hooks that they make into the framework? I think some things that we didn't mention yet are the, uh, that packages can also have like a facade to to work with. They can oh, yeah. expose mm -hmm. facades. And you can also do bindings in the service provider if you want to like uh, bind a certain client as a singleton or something. Yeah, that's something that you can also do in a in a in, in a in a package service provider. Yeah, I'm saying package service provider, but all service providers are basically equal. So anything yeah. that you can do in, in your project, you can also do in the package service provider. But that's a good point, though. So one of the things that I see a lot in, and when I say bridges, everyone, just so you know, a lot of the best packages in the PHP world are not intended for Laravel. They're just PHP, PHP packages. But one thing that's very common for people is that they'll build a bridge because if you go to, let's say, a package that makes it possible for you to interact with Stripe or something like that. So let's say, and this is not true for the Stripe SDK, but let's say you were to go to Stripe and they said, in order to use Stripe, you have to run these 15 lines of code before you actually use the thing. And that's in the PHP world. Well, in the Laravel world, you'd take these 15 lines and you'd go make your own Stripe service provider and run them once in your Stripe service provider, and then you're good, right? If that's the case, however, uh, somebody might build what they would call a Laravel Stripe bridge. And that package probably just requires the Stripe thing, and then it publishes a config file, it has its own service provider, and then that service provider, it just runs those 15 lines of code for you in a very laravel -y way. And so that's a good way to think about service providers, whether or not we're talking about packages, right? It's running the setup stuff that you only need to run once, but you need to run before you use the things that you need, right? Indeed. Yep. Right. Okay. So we've talked about the packages that come out of the box in Laravel. We've talked about what things that the packages commonly, you know, like are able to interact with in terms of our space. Are there any other kind of like intro to packages we should talk about before we start talking about gotchas and any of the other the other concerns there? Are there any other things you think we should be covering just for people to have a really good understanding of packages in the Laravel world? I think what Frig mentioned that that anything that you can do with a service provider in your own application, you can do within a package. I think that's uh, very important to understand mm -hmm. because it really, I think, demystifies package development, yeah. especially for Laravel. Because uh, if you want, you could build a monolithic application and then split it up into different packages and each, uh, sort of like the framework works under the hood, and then each part could be its own package. So. I think that really made it click for me that yeah. basically whatever I can do in a service provider, I can do within a package. And um, sometimes I also point. just do this to quickly scaffold a package. Uh, so I just create a service provider in my app and then prepare stuff in there. Yeah. Imagine that it's going to be a part of a package, even though right mm -hmm. now it's not. Yeah. And I think there's one of the cool points about that is we've actually at times had to extract internal packages for clients where that package never made it on public or packages at all. But that doesn't mean it wasn't still a package, right? So we said, you know what? We have three applications we're building here that are all going to have this same sets of logic. And it was a couple of models and some form requests and a couple other things. And we said, these are going to be accessible across all of them. These three very different applications being run by three different teams, uh, they need the same stuff. So we pulled all that shared logic out into something we called, you know, project name hyphen shared and then it had versioning you know there's pains that come along with it right because now if you need to make a change to that model you got to make the change to that model make sure the tests still work on all the other people that are consuming it publish the version so you know it's not just it's not free to do that but in that particular context it made sense and it's very similar to the whole concept of when do you split your thing out into microservices well do the do the costs you know basically measure well with the benefits you're getting from it but 
Hmm. Even that, I mean, in theory, you could take your entire application and make it a package and then have your app have nothing but that one dependency. Now, why would you do that? Who knows? But like you can wrap literally anything you want in a package. And that's a great point. One thing that you just briefly mentioned uh, is that you can also, which I think is very important, is that you can have packages that are private. Uh, so far, we haven't even talked about how packages get get discovered or uh, are published. And I think that's also something that is quite important that so there's packages, which allows you to discover all the public packages, but you can also set up a sort of like a private packages, which also exists as like an enterprise solution yeah, uh, so that you can support Composer. But you can also set it up yourself and host it on your own. And then you can have dependencies that are private that you can install and update through Composer, but only certain people can access it. Yeah, we can go down that road in just one second. But uh, Frank, is there something you wanted to say? Yeah, there is something maybe high level that we haven't touched upon yet. And for us, it's obvious, but I think for newcomers, it might not be that obvious. Yeah. Is that like tests can also live in a package. So yeah. the it's not only production codes that lives in the package, but the, the tests as well. Now, if you require a package, those tests aren't going to be in your project if the maintainer did that properly. But if you go to a any any package that has a bit of reputation, then it probably will has a tests uh, directory where all the tests of that that package live. Yeah, and it, and the note about what you said, if they configured it correctly, just so everybody knows, there is a thing that you can configure in your Git. Um, configuration that tells which of the things will and will not be installed to basically with the package. So you can have, uh, as a package author, you can have files that are committed to Git, but don't actually get installed when somebody uses Composer to install them. So, all right, so let's talk about distribution and publishing real quick. So because we've already done a, a packages episode, I'm just going to breeze through it. I won't even make you guys talk about it because you all should go listen to that uh, Composer and Packages episode. But Composer is the tool we use. It's like NPM for PHP. It's central repository rather than also being named Composer like NPM does. It's central repository. is called Packagist, P-A-C-K-A-G-I-S-T dot org. And that is pulling primarily from GitHub. I don't know if it can even pull from GitLab or anything or if it's GitHub only, but everything I've seen is from GitHub. And so people will put their packages up open source on there and then you'll get them distributed there. So everything that you see on packages, you're also able to see on GitHub. And that's how the distribution happens. Unlike NPM, you don't have to individually publish things using some command line tool. And instead, as a package author, it just synchronizes the state of your composer or your GitHub repo together with packages. So when you want to do a new release, you just do a new release or a new tag in GitHub, and then it pushes that tag over to packages, and that's it. So it's a lot simpler. There is something called private packages, with Mar which, which Marcel mentioned, which is packages.com. And you can either self-host or pay for a cloud version where you also get all those same values that you're getting from packages, and they manage it for you, but you have to pay them for it. But then the other option, which Marcel mentioned, is that you can also, in Composer, like we talked about in the Composer episode, you can expose things that are not paying for private packages, but are just private packages on your version control system, Bitbucket or GitLab or GitHub or whatever else. In your Composer configuration, all the consumers will have to go add that as a repository. Um, again, go listen to the Composer episode if you don't remember this. But basically, the simplest thing is I can say, hey, Marcel, I've got this private package. You can use it. Go add this line to your Composer.json, and now all of a sudden you have it as long as you have credentials that, you know, your local credentials show that you have access to this thing on GitHub. So you would have to make sure that whoever your deploy user is on your server also has access to that package or they'll just get something saying, hey, we can't we can't install that because we can't, you know, we can't see that repo. So there's lots of different ways to get access to these packages. But the number one most common way to do it is to either A, put it up on open source and GitHub and just make people add it to the repository as a VCS thing, um, meaning they they link it there, but not through Packagist. Or of course, the absolute most common is for somebody to publish it on Packagist, and then you can just require it with the simple strings like you're used to seeing. Um, there is one other thing you can also do in Composer, which is that you can reference a path on your local machine. So you get again, you can go to your repository section and say this is a path type one, and then you just give it a relative path on your server, and then it loads that in. So if you're developing your own packages internally, it doesn't even have to pull it down from GitHub. You could just clone it at a, a directory, you know, parallel to the one you're in right now. I know I breezed through that really fast, but again, go check out the Composer episode if that's something that you're unfamiliar with. Okay, so we just talked about a whole bunch of things before I kind of plow through further. Is there anything else that this picked up in your brains that you guys want to talk about? 
maybe something that we should mention, but it's probably also in the composer episode is, yeah, I want to name drop Satis because that is like the mm-hmm. name, like the self-hosted private packages that, uh, that you can install and you can have like authentication on there or not. Yeah. I just want to name drop that. Uh, um, so I actually don't know the difference. What's the difference between private packages and Satis or Satis or however you say it? I think private packages gets so with Satis you have to uh, keep it in sync with with your code on GitHub or whatever it is mm-hmm. yourself. And I think the private packages basically works like packages. Got it. Okay. And does this for you? I think. Okay. And Satis is free, right? Yeah, Satis is free and it's self-hosted. And yeah, private packages is like the SaaS version of uh, okay. of packages, I guess. Yeah, and that's S-A-T-I-S. And of course, we'll have all the links in the show notes. And that's a good note because there is a self-hosted version of private packages, but it's still a SaaS. So you're still paying 1,260 euro per year. So it's self-hosted private packages cost money, but does all the work for you. Satis is free, but you got to do all the work. Thanks for calling that out. I don't, I never even, for some reason, I'd always thought that Satis or Satis is uh, cost money. So uh, today I learned. Here you go. <laughs> uh, all right. Anything else you guys want to talk about before I, I move us forward? Yeah, maybe on um, requiring a package locally, why you want to do that. That's basically just for like testing out your, your own package. That's yeah, what I, what I do mostly when I create new packages. Just uh, create a new Laravel application. And inside of that composer, JSON, just point to the directory where I'm developing my package. And then you can just basically just use whatever whatever you want. And composer will symlink your package into the vendor directory of your project, which means that you can just type in, in your, your package and just program it. And all the changes without having you to run Composer update will be yeah. available in your local application. And that's like a golden way of developing packages, I think. Totally agreed. Yeah. And we and if you've ever developed Nova components, if you do Nova packages by default, it, it sets up your Nova package that you're developing in a, like a Nova components directory. But they're already kind of moving you in the direction of thinking, hey, I'm going to put all this package in its own little independent space and it's getting it linked in. So that if you want, you just rip that directory out and make it its own GitHub repo and then you're instantly there. So I think I like the idea of what you all are talking about is if you build your code and you say, man, this one thing is really separate from the rest of the app. It really has a kind of a minimal exposure to the rest of the app and it really makes sense for it to be its own thing well maybe at least start by putting its own piece of the php namespace if nothing else right so at least that that code's going to be its own own folder and then you can start thinking oh well now that's already in its own folder and it really only takes one dependency that'd be really easy for somebody else to inject maybe it's a time for me to extract it out and maybe you extract it out just to uh another folder you know in your sites directory or whatever and give it a name and pull it in with that composer path thing and that's it and maybe you never expose it yeah, anywhere else. But if you start building it that way, it makes it a lot easier to extract it later, for sure. All right. So normally the next step that we talk about is gotchas. And I think there's a lot of gotchas in the package world. Um, so let's talk less about gotchas for package authoring and more about gotchas for package consumption. What are things that you see people regularly tripping up on as they consume packages or they upgrade after they have a lot of packages or as they you know, try to install y'all's packages and run into problems? What are the, some of the gotchas in the, the package consumption world? I think in in general, what what always is a problem is if if you have a lot of dependencies from third parties, and a new Laravel version comes out, you end up having to basically update all of the dependencies um, because so with the semantic versioning of Laravel, a package might only work with Laravel eight point whatever. And when Laravel 9 comes out, then those packages won't automatically work anymore until the package maintainer took care of it. And this can be pretty frustrating because often it means waiting for the package maintainer to go and add support for the latest Laravel version, or uh, in the worst case, having to fork it, send a PR, and keep track of that fork for as long as it's not merged. I think that's like the biggest issue uh, and drawback that you have, especially if you have a lot of dependencies that Laravel updates will become more painful. 
Yeah, I also think what a drawback is for for package users is that if you if you're unlucky, your your package may uh, may become uh, unmaintained. Maybe the maintainer of your package just doesn't want to work on it, yeah. and it's perfectly in the right of a package maintainer to to do so. But yeah, this this can happen, and this this can be annoying. But I think a golden rule when you install a package is that either you should be able to take care of the code yourself or you should be able to switch to an alternative. If those two requirements are met, then it's probably safe to to use a package because you're not too dependent on it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, which I think nobody really thinks about because, I mean, you want to use a package because you don't want to deal with it and you don't want to find an alternative. Yeah, yeah. But then you take the risk. That's something that you need to right. be in. Uh, you need to keep in mind as well that you might then end up with an unmaintained uh, thing that you don't understand how to use. Uh. Now, something that I also pe- see people tripping up. Uh, this is a very small thing, and I think I basically see it because uh, when I create uh, new packages, and I and I also think you do it uh, as well, Marcel. If you create a package, then you mostly uh, target the latest PHP version. Right now it's PHP 8. And whenever um, a new PHP version comes along, people yeah need to install the new PHP version. Yep. But I think that a large portion of people aren't aware that like the PHP version in your browser that handles web requests can be different than the PHP version of the CLI version. Yep. And what I see a lot is that people say, hey, I could install your package, but in the browser it says uh, it has a syntax error. Yeah, and that's basically because yeah, the the PHP version that handles the web request hasn't been updated yet. And this is something that I see people tripping over over and over again. Actually, yep. yeah, it used to happen in Valet a lot, and we fixed it. So anybody who uses Valet, go update to the latest version of Valet. We had discovered this bug where sometimes you'd update Valet, but there'd be a socket still open. And so the web version, PHP FEM, was still using the old version, and you had to delete that socket file for it to refresh. So Dr. Byte, Chris, updated it so that it deletes that socket file manually. It doesn't always need to, because when things are working right, it doesn't need to, but he just added an extra check. So Valet people, you're much less likely to have this problem, just so you know. Uh, now that we mentioned uh, Dr. Byte C, Chris, I'd like to thank him for all the work that he does the maintaining best. our uh, permissions package as well. Oh, he cool. Does, nice. He, he does a lot, and not only for our package, but for Valet and, and other stuff as well. So, yeah, thanks for all your work, Chris. Love it. Yeah, he's a good guy. Okay, so you mentioned uh, you know the the suggestion of don't take on something unless you know there's an alternative or you know you're able to maintain it on your own. And I definitely think that there's going to some people who are going to say, well, then I'm never going to install any packages. And of course, that's not the response. But I would say that every package you install introduces the possibility that at some point the author of that package no longer wants to maintain it. And so I think what the healthy response it can give us all is a little bit of skepticism with every package. Because some people say, hey, I could write this code, but with a package, you know, I don't have to. That's not good enough reason. Because maintaining your own code that is very simple is sometimes easier than and healthier long term than maintaining, you know, bringing in a package that does the same thing, but also does 10,000 other things that might introduce breaking changes because your use case is not as common or the person may get burnt out. But on the other hand, that could be saying, well, then never use a package if you can write it yourself. And that's also not true because every line of code that you write is now code that you're responsible for maintaining. So on the other hand, if you could write it yourself, but the package does it in two lines and you would have to write it in 40 lines and you wouldn't think about the security concerns that the package author thought about whatever, well, then use the package. And so it's so weird because every time we think about a package, there's this line. It's not a really easy answer of whether to use a package or not. There's good reasons not to use a package here and there's good reasons to use a package here. And you just got to develop a sense to try and consider all those ramifications. What long-term maintenance costs am I introducing by bringing in this package that may not be maintained or may later break or may not be updated for Laravel 8 in time or 9 in time, but also what maintenance costs am I introducing by writing this code myself when I'm probably not as good at knowing all the nuances that need to be considered. Like the number of times I've seen people try to write things themselves and then introduce security bugs as a result of that has been high. However, I would say that the number one problem that I see when people decide to write it themselves instead of going the other way is not third-party packages, but is internal packages. So if you think you're going to write your own code better than stuff that comes with Laravel, you're probably wrong. 
I'm just going to state. Like, it's not just Taylor, although Taylor's brilliant, but Taylor plus the the tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people who've used that code, looked at that source. I mean, if we're talking about using, we're talking about millions of people, but looked at that source code who know that particular topic really well and have pull requested all the little edge cases and nuance and stuff like that. The likelihood that you're going to catch all that by rewriting that thing yourself is basically zero. So when it comes to Laravel core functionality, just don't rewrite it. It doesn't matter how cool you think you are or how much you hate stuff that other people wrote. Just do it yourself. When it comes to third-party packages, I think that concept should be introduced a little bit. Because just because a package exists for something doesn't mean that they're going to maintain it. Doesn't mean that they're actually really right, good at write, writing this thing in the first place, right? Like, So be a little more skeptical and try to balance that. Do I introduce the cost of my own code being maintained or do I introduce the cost of a package? Both of them have costs. You just got to balance them. I also think that as we briefly touched upon looking at packages and discovering how and deciding when should I use which package, I think one important factor is, does it have tests? Because even if you, at the point of requiring it, are not maybe thinking about, hey, can I take care of this later on? Mm -hmm. If it has tests, then you at least know that somebody thought about having writing tests for this in the first place. Yeah. And if it comes to the situation that you have to maintain it yourself or keep working on it, uh, extend it, then you can use those tests as a guidance. I think that's also uh, a lot that even if it's something simple that you could write your own, maybe you haven't thought about that edge case that a certain test covers. Right. Yeah, I also want, want to add because maybe I was a little bit too harsh with those two rules of when requiring a package. I don't want to uh, demotivate people for using package for the right reasons. I think you're also good if a package is, is very popular. Yes. Because if a package is very popular and the original maintainer abandons it, probably Somebody the community will, will step in to do yep. that. And that's happened uh, yeah, a while ago with yeah, something that's even in the composer JSON file of Laravel yep. itself with, uh, with the Faker, Faker library, yeah. where the original author didn't uh, have any motivation or time or whatever. Any, any reason is good to, uh, to abandon the package, I think. Yeah. And he said, I'm not going to do this anymore. Does somebody want to take over? And I think a bunch of, of people, I, th I think uh, Taylor and Graham and a bunch of other people, they just stepped in and are maintaining it now under another vendor name. So Which I'm sure we will see spring up in the, the Laravel Composer Jason soon. You know, it'll probably pull and so it'll just push over and everybody will migrate. And that's and that's fine. And I, I think that's a really good I was going to go somewhere else, but now I want to go somewhere with this with this. The attitudes people have towards open source maintainers can sometimes be a little bit unhealthy. And so I want to make a quick note that when somebody opens an open source package, they are taking a little bit of responsibility on themselves for, for long term maintenance. Right. Like when Daniel Colborn worked at Titan and he wanted to make Ziggy, the first thing I told him was, Daniel, just so you know, the moment you make Ziggy, you're going to be in this moment of excitement. But you're now this is your baby. You don't have to take care of this baby. You know, I said forever. And he's like, I totally understand. But the thing is, it's not necessarily forever. You should intend to be able to do it long term before you make the package for sure. Don't make a package that you don't think you can maintain. But that doesn't mean that those intentions are going to be true forever. You have no idea what your life is going to be like six months from now or a year from now or whatever. And so it is a completely valid thing for open source maintainers who are giving that time for free to abandon a package or to not have time to respond to your issues, your pull requests. You know, that's just life. Now, the good thing is there's a lot of people in our community who have taken up the mantle of saying, hey, I may not have package ideas of my own, but I love helping package maintainers. And so you're going to see people like Chris. Now, Chris also does have packages of his own, but Chris, Dr. Byte, or you also see Tom Witkow. Dev Gumi Beer, both of them and quite a few other people just love to go around and help people run their packages. And we are so, so, so grateful for those folks because they end up being the lifeblood of those packages more than the people who originally created them. I am the, the formal maintainer of Valet. I didn't write Valet in the first place, and I still don't do the majority of the code review. So I'm the one who basically is pulling the switches and doing the releases. And I have a little bit of input on like kind of the direction of the thing. But in the end, Dr. Byte is the major, he is the primary maintainer from a code perspective, right? And neither Taylor nor Adam really touch Valet at all these days. And that's not a problem. So I think we need to recognize that the people who are creating these things, they were not paid for it. They do not owe us anything. What I think the number one thing, if I would ever expect a package author to owe us, is to tell us if they're going to deprecate something. I, th I think if I ever get mad at a package author for non non commitment, is if they don't if they let the thing die, but they never say they're letting the thing die. And I'm just like, and I'll open an issue usually just saying, can you just tell us if you're letting this th thing die, and so that we can respond appropriately. But like, 
we all have lives, we all have jobs and we can't predict them. We can't predict global pandemics, you know? And so I think it's really valuable for us to just say, like, I recognize that the individual people maintaining this are humans because I think the type of issues that people open, how is this really doing this bubble? Yes, it really is. And there's probably some context or reason you don't understand that may have to do with a sickness in my family or, or, you know, like, and sometimes they're, they're upset about a lack of response or sometimes they're upset about, you know, the thing not working the way they were expecting. Well, turns out, you know, sunshine, you're not the center of the universe. And I wasn't thinking about, you know, I wrote this thing. So remember when you're interacting with these package authors that they are doing this work for free for you and for the rest of the community. And if you really want things to be different and you don't see a way for it, well, then it's either you got to put up with it being the way it is or you got to put the work in to make it different. So as and this is not just to, you know, from package authors to package consumers, because as package authors, we can do this to each other as well. Let's just all be gracious and aware that these are human beings that we're interacting with. Interestingly, the thing I was about to say speaks to almost the opposite end of this. So I think that it's good to say both of them at the same time. One of the things that you can note, not just the whether or not there are tests in this package, is how many open issues and pull requests does it have? Because that can often tell you a lot about how able are they to maintain it. Now, the number is not a perfect gauge. Like I have quite a few packages that have a lot of issues and pull requests open, but it's because they're long running things that we still have not figured out rather than things that haven't been addressed. So it's not that it's a perfect thing you can look at. But I would say if you see one package with five issues and five pull requests and a bunch of stars and another package with similar number of stars or whatever validating things, then it's got 300 pull requests and 2000 issues. There's a big note there to you about like what's what what their ability to address like kind of the work coming their way looks like. Yeah, if we're talking about like metrics that you can could use to determine if if a package is uh, something trustworthy to use. Mm -hmm. Something that I also take a look at is when was the last change made? Yes. Now this yeah. this isn't like a watertight thing because sometimes packages are just finished. Yeah. All yeah. features yeah, are it there. Need any more it, don't, it it isn't abandoned. It's just finished. It just works. But, yeah. 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 But more often than not, then if if there is like uh, some activity on a package, that's a good sign. Yeah. Not having activity is not per se a bad sign, but having yeah. recent activity is a good sign. That's a great point. All right. So we're getting near the end of, well, well we're, we're already way past the normal time, but I knew this one was going to run late. So that's total fine. Um, but I want to ask, are there any other gotchas, any th things that you think people get stuck on as package consumers that we have not covered yet? I think without diving too much into semantic versioning, something that that can bite you is that sometimes package authors might not stick to semantic versioning the mm -hmm. way that they they should or well yeah <laughs> they should yeah. from a consumer point of view and then you would just pull in a new uh, bug fix release for example and it breaks your code so this is something that can always happen um that you just need to be aware of that yeah. even though we have semantic versioning in place and even if your composer json restricts to pull in updates that could break something mm -hmm. we're just working with other human beings that might make errors and publish yeah. a tag that shouldn't be published and yeah this yeah. could just happen every time a quick reminder to everybody in theory if you got a three versions of your your version you've got let's say 1.1.1 1 .1 .1. Um, if they increment the last version, it should only be patches. So no breaking changes whatsoever. So you should always be able to allow those changes in. If you got 1.1, .1, so if you're going from 1.1 .1 to 1.2, it should still have no breaking changes, but it should allow for new features to be added. So in theory, you should also be able to upgrade that second one without any breaking changes. The only time breaking changes should be introduced in Semver is that first one. So as long as you lock it to anything between 1 and 2, you know, so that would be caret 1.0.0 is the most common way of doing it, or right no carrot 1.0 god i still am bad at these yeah, yeah. um yeah. so if you do that it'll allow you to go anywhere up to 1.9999999 but it won't let you go up to two so if you have a constraint like that in theory that package should never break but marcel's saying that's in theory and we got to recognize that people aren't perfect and i've I have re I've released breaking changes on packages, and thankfully, I always figured it out either immediately as soon as I released it or within you know 24 hours, and I immediately pushed out another release that, release that fixed it. Every once in a while, I'd push out a release that broke things at the same time I was changing a PHP version constraint in the release, and then it's even harder. So there's mm -hmm. there's just like sometimes it's, it's a pretty complicated dance, right? So again, this is not asking for grace, although hopefully you can have a little grace for the package authors, but also just saying, and Marcel, if I'm understanding you correctly, just know that... Just because you put your constraint right doesn't mean you're perfectly protected from things breaking. Right. Another reason to yeah. have tests, right? 
Yeah, and I also want to add, and yeah, I don't want to yeah put more horror on requiring a package in, in your application. <laughs> but uh, in theory, every release can be breaking because uh, imagine yeah that um, you that the package exposes some some clause or something and you extend from that clause and you add a function on that and then on the base on on the package the author adds the same function with a different yeah. signature mm -hmm. yeah your your application will break so in it, it breakages can 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 happen you need to be aware of that and and even if the author did everything right, it can still break in your your project. That's now that that being said, it's a little bit uncommon that it happens, but it but it can. Yeah. All right. Any other gotchas we want to cover before we wrap up for the day? I think we got the most important yeah. ones. I think I could could ramble on with people that just require the namespace of a clause and not the facade, and then things start breaking because uh, things get called statically, stuff stuff like that. But they're 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 more smallish things. Yeah. I think we covered the big ones. Uh, okay. So normally I'd say where can people learn more about this, but unless you guys stop me, I don't know if there's any places that really teach you about packages really well. I think there's some things that teach you about package development really well. But I don't know if there's anything that teaches you a ton about packages. So I would say check out the Composer episode of this podcast and also check out next season where I'm going to be walking you through individual packages. If there's anywhere I would think about where I learn about packages, I would say the Laravel News podcast. They talk about packages a little bit, not in great depth. But is there anywhere else that you all think about that teach you either about new packages that are coming out or just about using packages in general? I don't know if I know of anything. I think in the there's Laravel a... documentation that there is, there is a page on it. Oh, is there? Well. Okay. Is that what you're going to say too, Marcel? And there's, uh, no, I wanted to mention, there's a community project that um, John Brown is his name. He created, which is called laravelpackage.com. And it's basically like full documentation about everything about package development, oh, development in a yeah. written form. Cool. Uh, so, yeah. Um, That's okay, we can and talk about that. it basically teaches you everything about the development of the package. That's very cool. Yeah. So in the I just looked at the docs and the docs that talk about packages are literally just telling you about the third party or the first party package that Laravel has. It's not actually talking about, but it is good to know about all those. So go check them out. Um, but let, yeah, so let's talk about if I wanted to develop packages. So we've got a free one here from John Brown that is called laravelpackage.com. And it's a really nice, easy to read thing. Thank you so much for that note. It's just telling you about how to do mailables and jobs and notifications and models and setting up your development environment. And this is great. It even talks about test bench, which is the way you, it's a little bit complicated, uh, the way to run, um, to write tests in your packages that sort of give you a pretend version of Laravel to work with. This is awesome. So if I were not just to want to read this, but if I were to want to, you know, per se, watch a video course about package development, I think there's a couple options out there. Marcel, would you talk to me about yours first? And then, uh, Frey, could you tell me about one too? Uh, yeah, I mean, Frey and I, we both published and created video courses about package development. So, yeah, my What's yours? What's the name? What's the URL? And then yeah, it's Frey PHP Package Development, and it's available at phppackagedevelopment.com. Um, Link in the show notes. It is about generic PHP package development and also covers Laravel specifics, but it's basically, we're starting with an empty folder, create a package, and at the end, integrate it into Laravel and publish it on packages. Yep. Frey? Uh, yeah, I created a uh, a course as well, and I think both courses are uh, quite on par. I think it just depends if you like prefer a German accent or a, a Belgian <laughs> accent explaining yeah, you, yeah. you can even tell the <laughs> all, all, <laughs> all the things there. <laughs> uh, mine is at uh, Laravel Package uh, dot Training. We have a fancy dot Training uh, domain there. And in addition to uh, building framework agnostic packages and building a Laravel package, uh, there's also some videos on source diving uh, existing packages. So you can just see uh, what what the things that we did in our packages, so what techniques that that uh, that we used uh, uh, there. Awesome. Yeah. 
Okay. I will talk at, at another date about um, sponsoring. Um, so we don't need to go into large detail here, but I would just say if you use packages, go check out the um, the GitHub page for the packages that you're using. And that's a place for those folks to say, hey, you can sponsor us. So if you see something, they, and they don't necessarily even necessarily have to talk about how to sponsor them. Sometimes they say, sponsor me by, there's something called Treeware Earth. And they say, sponsor me by donating trees or sponsor me by whatever else. At Titan, I'm actually working on a thing that says, if you like our packages, here's all the people whose packages we like. Go sponsor them, right? So I'm actually going to make a page for that because we don't need the sponsorship. I actually, I actually made a Titan sponsorship page. Fun story, with the idea for like people could give a little bit to us, but we would just kind of turn around and give that money away. Or maybe there's going to be like a one dollar tier just to say, hey, we like you, thank you. And the folks at Titan looked at it and they're like, you know what, that feels kind of gross because our whole pitch is that we think that we can make a consultancy able to, you know, like to, mm-hmm. our whole pitch is, and this nobody needs to else, else needs to do this way, but we can make our consultancy fully viable such that it funds twenty percent time and 20% time is when we make our packages. So why should we ask for money for it? And that's, again, that's not how other consultancies do it. There's no shame, but they said that to me. And I was like, yeah, you're absolutely right. Thank you for bringing that up. So I scrapped the entire thing. I'd written it. I had applied for sponsorship. We got it all scrapped the whole thing. And we're just going to, we're going to do a little thing. So everyone considers, but I think the idea is if you use a package regularly, go look and see if that person has mentioned what thank you looks like, like, um, Spotsy's thank you looks like, um, at least for the longest time was sent as a postcard. I think you have sponsorship now, right? Yeah, we have sponsorship. Okay. We have a call of action for a for uh, for paying products, and then we have like the the postcardware, which is still uh, still mentioned. Yeah, postcardware. Uh, yeah. So, but no matter what, I would just say find the ways to support them. And if they have paid things, like both Marcel and Frank do, then go look at their paid things and see if you can get them. I mean, I would say that their paid things are great anyway. But maybe that can be like a hey, I got free value from this. I'm going to buy your paid thing. Um. So just, but in general, when you look at a, a a person, especially if you run a company, if you're a CTO or something like that recognize the free labor that has gone into basically making you have to do less work to make your thing work and just go see if those package authors are potentially asking for you to support them financially, support them with postcards, support them with trees or by buying their paid products or something else like that. Again, I'm going to talk about this in greater detail at another date. So, all right. Anything else that we didn't cover today that you guys wanted to cover before we wrap up? Maybe I want to end by by saying that if you want to get into package development, and it seems like a lot and confusing. Don't don't be too scared. You know, it is a lot, and it can be it can be scary. Personally, I about uh, or a few weeks ago, I tried creating a package in another language in Ruby, and it was like, whoa, what is this all? Yeah. And I can imagine that if you're starting with Laravel of PHP package development, you'll have the same feeling. Um, I'm going to give like the advice from the Hitches Guide to the Galaxy. Don't panic. Uh, be calm. Uh, follow the show notes uh, that uh, that you, Matt, will probably put here, and there will be probably a lot of helpful resources. Reach out to people. Personally, I can say if you're getting stuck with package development, tweet at me. It's if it's something that I can help quickly with, uh, I will do that. Love it, Marcel. Anything else? Yeah, one thing that I recently saw, which I really liked, is there's this great Larabels initiative from Susanna and she built a package live on stream Yeah, and uh, Tom Witkowski um, yep. helped her along with it. She uh, also had no knowledge of package development and they built, I think it was a blade component package from mm-hmm. scratch over the course of uh, two streaming sessions. So yeah, as Frick said, don't be afraid of this. Um, it's a great idea. Yeah. Just ask for help. I'll put those YouTubes in the show someone. notes. And, and, and if, yeah. you're, if you're getting nervous, it's a great way to do it. Susanna is brilliant in many ways, but I think the, the one of the things I appreciate about her the most is her willingness to do things when she says, I don't know what I'm doing. And it's very nerve wracking to do it, let alone do it publicly. But like the first stream she ever did was, I was just like, hey, can you come on some streams with me? And she's like, I hardly even know Laravel right now. I was like, you're, you're great. So I, I think that she does a really good job of making us all feel a little bit less nervous because she does it and she does it great and she does it with grace. And so that not only should that encourage us all to try but I think the specific reference to those videos, we'll put those in the show notes as well. So thanks, Marcel. All right. So the fun moment at the end of everything, I've had both of you in the podcast multiple times. So, I'm, you know, can ru- I could run out of fun <laughs> moments, but I thought of something earlier today that I really like. So if PHP and Laravel, which just to everybody knowing this is not going to happen, I promise. If PHP and Laravel just completely fell off the face of the planet and for some reason there was just unfixable, unmanageable things and it was just completely useless, what job would you move to next? And whoever wants to start can. 
Ooh. <laughs> That's Take a time. difficult one. Yeah, for me, it would doing something with computers was always clear from the very beginning that I wanted to do something with this. So I guess it would still have to do something with it. And yeah. if I would would absolutely need to do something completely different, I would love to explore uh you know, becoming a board game inventor and come up with a board game creator. And I like that. That's come cool. up with that. Yeah, that's also a sort of package, right? A package with <laughs> yeah, a board so game and pieces in it. So <laughs> yeah. I love it. <laughs> yeah, I think if if I would go I it doesn't have to be economically viable at all. I would do something with music probably. Yeah, that's like my my other passion. Yeah, probably I would do that. So if I know you do music and I, but I, you do it in a couple contexts, I think you have a band, but you also, were you DJing? Are you still DJing? Like what would your dream job be in music? Oh, it would be definitely be in a band. I'd okay. also make some music on, on my own, but in a band, it's just so much, uh, much nicer. Uh, I think like, yeah, there are so many parallels to developing and, and being in a band. Uh, that's, that's also an episode on its own. Yeah. But what I like being in a band is that you can be like a leader where people can look up to you and follow you. And you can be like uh, the, the lowest uh, guy you just need to follow at the same time, you know. It's, yeah. uh, it's something that I got from an artist called Moondog. They, they okay. are, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a German, I think, blues artist and he said they asked where do you get the name moon dog from well sometimes you're the moon sometimes you're the dog you know <laughs> that's and that's something that that stick with uh that stuck with me so definitely i want to play in the band and not the whole time on my own okay got it my joke is always that i would go off and become a farmer but now these days i'm thinking a little bit more like i would like to do something with woodworking just because i'm enjoying it so much mm -hmm. but in reality if php and laravel went away i would just change titan i mean titan already does as much of you and react and view native script and react native and other things as you know anything else so i would probably just move over to you know elixir and keep doing what we're doing but it's nice to imagine the whole computer world went away what would we do so i like it guys all right um so i, I think for for uh -huh. for spassy if if we had all the computers have blown up probably yeah. we we would become cooks or something because yes. we have so much people that just love eating and That's love awesome. uh making making good food so they would be like a cooking company That's awesome. we would send you packages with food there you go packages <laughs> of food i like it so okay so the for each of you i'll do reverse alphabetical this time i want to ask you how can people follow you and how can they pay you money and it's funny because i say that at the end of many episodes and most people don't know how to answer it i know y'all do know so maybe just pick one way for them to pay you money because otherwise we'll be here for the rest of the day so how do they follow you on whatever major social networks and then how can they pay you money number one option marcel uh yeah if you want to follow me twitter would be the social network of choice okay. uh, marcel putziot is my twitter handle Making and if you want to spend money on beyond code stuff you can check out beyondcode.de with all the hopefully great dev tools and video courses love it Vic. Yeah, for me, it's uh, it's almost the same. It's the same format. The uh, social media network of choice is uh, Twitter. My handle is Freak Mirza. I also have a blog, Freak.dev, where I blog about uh, Laravel development a lot. If you want to spend your hard-earned dollars or currency of choice, head over to spacy.be slash products, where there are paid products, excellent paid products and video courses to spend your uh, time and money on. And you could also consider spending money at odear.app, which is a monitoring service that I built together with my buddy, uh, Matthias. I love it. All right. So this is the last episode. I actually had to pause and check to make sure this is the last episode of season four. And I've had so much freaking fun. Thank you to all the guests. Thank you to you two. Thank you to all your listeners. There is a season five coming. I already know what it's going to be. A little hint. This particular episode happens to be the last episode for a reason. So season five is going to touch on some of the things we've think same things we're going to be talking about here. But I'm going to take a little break and I'm going to do a little bit of work on my own podcast and streaming. So we'll be back in a couple months. I promise I'm not going to take a year to find the music this time. I swear. But thank you guys so much for uh, doing this last roundup episode with me. This was a ton of fun. It was really cool having the both of you on. I've gotten to know you guys over the years, and I enjoy both of you, and you're both really brilliant in this particular area as well. So thank you so much for your time. And listeners, thank you so much for tuning in every week. And I won't see you next time on this, this episode, but I'll see you next time in the podcast. Thanks, guys. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.